evening, afternoon, and in some cases, uh, very, very much into the evening. Um, a good evening, I hope, nonetheless, um, to everyone who's joining us today. Uh, this is the third in a series, and I'd just like to take time to do a couple of introductions and acknowledgements before we get started. Um, we are hosted today by the Visual Identities in Art and Design Research Center, BIAD, uh, which is housed in the University of Johannesburg Faculty of Arts, Design and Architecture, known as FADA. BIAD supports an international community of visiting professors, research associates, affiliated researchers, and postdoc fellows whose diverse research projects promote critical thinking and feeling around two core thematic currents in relation to visual practice. Um, these include African and African diaspora histories, identities, and creative human practices, as well as practice based engagements exploring connections between art, design, and life sciences. Um, Viad, who, who is so pleased to host um, Malika. Um, also uh, includes her in the program as a research associate. Um, and Nalika Jayawatan has been running a series of webinars um, under the heading Photography Power and uh, the Ethics of Representation. And she's been running these through the platform called Read in the Moment. Read in the Moment is a curated digital space in which VIAD research associates, as well as invited guests from the greater VIAD research community can share recent presentations, projects, interviews, digital exhibitions, and interactive dialogues as creative response to the salient social and political questions of our time. Um, later in today's program, towards the end, I'll drop some links into the chat uh, to webinars that were uh, earlier in this year and the year before. Today, she presents with a panel of esteemed colleagues, so much African photography, so few African photographers. It's a bit tongue-in-cheek, and I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Uh, Nilika is joined by Marwa Abulela of Photopia Cairo. Marwa is the co-founder and managing partner of Photopia, an independent photography school in Cairo. She is also the founder and curator of Cairo Photo Week a diverse photo festival in the heart of downtown Cairo that brings together the most influential image makers in Egypt and the region. Uh, Ofa Feki is also with us, who is an esteemed independent curator. Um, during the Arab Springs, where photography became a weapon for freedom, Ofa moved to an international scale by collaborating with renewed institutions and agencies, such as World Press Photo, Magnum Agency, and nor agency to contribute to the establishment of a new generation of photojournalists in the North African shores. Quite important work. Uh, Jim Chuchu is also with us. Uh, Jim is co-founder of the Nest Collective, a multidisciplinary collective based in Nairobi, Kenya, that has created works in film, music, fashion, visual arts, and literature, such as the critically acclaimed queer anthology film, Stories of Our Lives. The film so far has been screened in over 80 countries and won numerous awards, such as the Jury Prize at the 2015 Berlin, Berlinau Teddy Awards. Again, quite impressive. The Geto Makola wraps up an incredible program of panelists, and he is the former head of Market Photo Workshop in Johannesburg and currently the CEO of Java UP Art Center at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. He has been part of a number of diverse visual storytelling platforms that curatorial committee and curatorial committees that include Recontes de Bamako in Mali, New York Times Portfolio Reviews, and chairing the World Press Photo Awards General Jury 2020. Uh, and this incredible lineup has been put together and convened, of course, by Nilika. Um, and Nilika is Associate Professor of English at the State University of New York Oswego campus and a research associate, as mentioned already, at Beard. Uh, she's a recipient of the 2018 Creative Capital Andy Warhol Foundation Arts Writers Grant. For I think Lois has, um, you've frozen a bit. Um, <laughs> should we try to get you back? Or maybe we, we could- had, um, We just had low shading in South Africa, I guess maybe might be. 
<laughs> so um, yes, I'm affiliated with Bayad in um, at the, uh, the University of um, Johannesburg, and that's the um, uh, main reason that this um, webinar is even possible, and um, that we were able to partner with them, or that I was able to partner with them. So I'm very very grateful to um, Bayad and the staff, and um, to the director at um, of Bayad for do, um, helping us. Um, make this idea come to fruition and i'm so grateful for all of you for being present and for um everyone who is joining me as a panelist who i've known um some of you a couple of you just from social media and knowing about your work a couple of you i've met over the last decade and um learned so much from your work uh Legeto, i've known you for even longer than a decade which is scary um <laughs> I think we first met when we were very young at a talk with um, David Goldblatt and then um, I met Jim um, when he gave an incredible TED talk that really changed my life and it changed my students lives who um, then saw it because I shared it with them um, when I returned um, back to the US and I'm, um, it's wonderful to be able to actually meet and work with Olfa and um, uh, Marwa because I've long known about your work, but I have never met you in person. Um, but I did notice that we probably attended the same um, photography art festivals <laughs> um, from your social media pictures. Um, so um, what I wanted to start with was to um, speak a little bit about um, the the background and the um, con conceptualization of this um, um, conversation. This is, the, um, this is what I wanted to start with, um, and essentially, um, what, um, the question is: you know, I think I started with is photography and its trouble in Africa or with Africa. And I want to bring your attention um, to three sets of images, two of which were published on the cover of influential publications with a global reach. One of these two is a fashion image and the others um, images from the news. And um, first, I wanted to show you something that it hasn't got to do with Africa, but it has to do with photography's history with Africa. And but this is Annie Leibovitz's photographs of um, um, LeBron James and um, with Giselle Bunchen, and it's uh, quite an old image from the cover of a magazine. And you can see the kind of tropes that the photographer is using. And it is Annie Leibovitz who everybody thinks of as um, a person with no, you know, questions asked, a, a fantastic photographer. But you can be a fantastic photographer, be famous, and be the go-to person for all photo shoots in um, in fashion, but also not be a person who understands the history of photography and how it reproduces racist tropes. And so, when often we see these images um, as Africans and those who work within African photography, or even black photographers of the African diaspora, we know immediately what this message is about because this message has actually affected the day to day ways in which we are seen. Um, however, when we question the photographer, um, often or the publication, where all the editors of these publications, we're often told, um, you know, this is a powerful image, we're not racist. And I think it's one of the most important things for um, me to kind of address is the idea that it's not that we're calling you racist if you're fragile enough and that you can't handle that, but I'm saying that there is a history um, that these images keep repeating and um, you're not understanding perhaps that we can all reproduce racist imagery and racist ideas through images without even being conscious of it. And um, I had to go through that education and I'm continuing to go through that education. It's, it's for a life. And um, so I think the next um, set of images that I wanted to um, present are um, news images. And I'm sure if you um, were present during um, you know, the last five years um, reading the news. This was the cover image on um, the New York Times, 
This is Rick Gladstone's, um, oh, sorry, Rick Gladstone's story with the photographs from Aris Masanis' um, images um, for a 2016 story in the New York Times um, titled, Stepping Over the Dead on a Migrant Boat. Even the title itself is reminiscent of um, racist ideas about black life not valuing life. Um, of, of our own, that we are literally stepping over the dead um, without any concern. I wonder if those were white human beings there, would first of all their um, bodies be displayed in this way for a global public to consume? And second of all, would the title be that we are so callous that we are stepping over the dead rather than to think about the incredible um, sorrow and sadness people must have faced on that boat and to live with the dead who died on that boat and to scramble to survive like that um, rather than to highlight the indignity of walking over the dead um, and to highlight a sort of callousness and emotional detachment from life. Um, and so anyone familiar with this history that links photography with the European encounter with its, with its colonial other in Africa will be able to excavate the visual layering in this image, revealing the same old racist narratives. The photographer and the writer of the article may have been completely unconscious about the racist narratives with which they are working, but the picture editors at newspapers know which are the uh, images that they would see as quote winning images that their audiences will often respond to. What constitutes a worthy image is often one that reinforces the pre-existing narratives with which a paper's primary customer base are familiar. You're not going to put something that shows dignity, survival, um, the sorrow maybe, but in sorrow in ways that again, undignifies people. And um, I'll, I'll go through some of the images, but I don't necessarily want to show all of them because I think, again, in reproducing these images, it's, we are returning to um, the same, you know, doing the same thing. And so um, some of these are, um, you'll be able to see some of these. Um, and I think, um, Uh, I'm not having um, some of these pictures can't be displayed, but um, I'm I'm just having trouble with it. Um, I think, and um, the other part I think once we move on from these particular images, is that um, many of you who work in photography um, and African photography centers curate photography and also. Um, the images that um, you work with and you run photo festivals, um, you know that um, sometimes um, groups of photographers who purport to be very aware of these issues sometimes reproduce the same um, kinds of imagery. And it's very difficult to um, ask for anything that is more responsible. And I, um, there are times when um, I feel like the same group of people um, end up calling, you know, doing this business of calling out, which I often find not necessarily productive to keep calling out. Um, I want to, you know, in a way move towards um, calling to responsibility rather than um, that if you are responsible, you do have to take action because responsibility and action go together. And to sim only to call out, I don't think, ask for action because calling out puts the responsibility on the person who is calling out. It doesn't hold the other person who is creating the issue um, accountable. And so this is an, um, I think you can see this, this is an image from um, Noor Images. And um, I mean, I will ask um, Olfa and Mawa to talk more about um, this particular agency, who, who, who um, you know, I respect very much, but it, this was a call um, to Tanzanian and Kenyan visual storytellers to um, a masterclass, but this is the image that they chose to use. 
And um, I think, you know, up, um, um, Duck Rabbit, which is runs a photo um, um, teaching um, organization in, in, in Britain, in fact, um, was the first person to draw attention to it. And um, he, um, that's Benjamin, um, who also said, you know, there could be, here's the thing about that image, which was taken in Nigeria. It could be, you could swap it out for almost any quote developing country where black and brown bodies are quote scavenging and rubbish. How many of these pictures do you think were taken by white people? He asked this very directly. And he said, um, we also uh, teach honest workshops and public programs around photography, media literacy and representation. Um, that's the agency's conversation, but how are you being responsible to those you teach? Because you're disseminating the same kind of expectations to young photographers who will then for another generation reproduce those same things. And I think one of the most um, sharp critiques came from Andrew Jackson, who said, um, a photographer who's British, but is now based in Canada, um, the gaze which has damned you will now teach you to see because the conversation produced, um, produced these kinds of um, racist imagery that continue to demean um, black and brown people that to begin with, the, um, the Europe, that kind of European or white gaze damned us to being this kind of scavenging um, bodies. And now they are purporting to actually teach us how to photograph. And that I find very, very dangerous because what we do is also re, um, produce young black and brown photographers, young uh, photographers from Asia, Arab, uh, Arab countries, and um, African countries and you know, Latin American, South American countries to photograph in using these same visual tropes without a critical education. And often we also um, can very easily succumb to the same kind of images. So um, having um, done this introduction, um, I want to just open up for conversation with my colleagues and um, let you take the floor. So um, maybe I should um, begin by asking Olfa and uh, Marwa, who have been involved with curating and running photo festivals, to um, comment on, um, because you both wanted to speak about um, the lack of infrastructures that means that often um, photography centers or um, photography teaching centers um, have difficulty functioning because we're talking about changing the image narrative or the image repertoire in the world in a, in a way, which is a very big thing to do. So <laughs> how do you really do that? Um, when there's so much influence that already European and American, North American um, photographers have about the visualization of black and brown people. Um, so I wanted to open it up to you, to the two of you, to speak about the, the, the very real challenges that you have faced um, from um, the areas in which you work. Um, thank you for inviting me to start with. Um, and I think the difference between me and Marwa, uh, or like Tunisia and, and Egypt, is that Marwa has achieved so much in, that, uh, in the educational part of photography, which is something we can be jealous of because we don't have this here yet. Uh, but 10 years ago, I think the Arab Spring allowed uh, Tunisia and other North African to be more open to photojournalism. And this is uh, how I, um, I started in this field, by hosting a lot of workshops by, from, in collaboration with a lot of institutions like the WordPress Photo, Magnum, or Noor to educate which is a word that I don't like to use here in Africa, but they uh, hosted um, workshops to gather, first of all, uh, a lot of photojournalism and help them uh, and train them to photojournalism. But that was also a way for them to register a lot of names that they didn't know. Uh, so they would have a register uh, and new names uh, of photojournalism, uh, photojournalists in North Africa to, to assign, for example, in the future. 
Um, but to go back to maybe the picture that you've posted of Noor, I uh, find myself a bit in a in a very sensitive position because uh, I consider that kind of picture a bit of failure for me as well, because I was part of um, Noor Agency for a while and I didn't succeed into changing maybe major stuff that uh, maybe I should have insisted in because this kind of picture for a workshop uh, that is supposed to aim uh, a call for uh, photographers from Africa, it's like saying we are here to educate you because you're not educated. And this picture is showing that. And this is maybe uh, something that uh, we don't say much because the picture, uh, the previous picture shows immigrants uh, or how they like to call us immigrants because they love for them, uh, for us to call them expats when they are here and immigrants because we are there. Uh, and this is only because they have the pri privilege to come without a visa and for us to go with a visa. Um, and I think also we are a bit to blame for the lack of education as well, because in many countries and obviously South Africa and Egypt are one of them have initiated such program uh, to um, be responsible for the local education when in other African countries, uh, and I, I'm going to um, take the blame for what I'm going to see, uh, still a bit lazy, or Tunisia is still a bit lazy in doing initiatives that can help the local community. Uh, but I've seen that, for example, Mawa have come from, from far uh, by because I witnessed how she started with a very small place and how this have grown up to um, a bigger center and now also uh, have a, I think a very big festival that I think one day and soon, I hope, uh, would be on the same level of international festivals and would be on the calendar of every professional in the world. Um, so um, both of you also, um, spoke about um, the lack of um, trained or people who do curation and also um, um, publications and why um, can you talk a little bit about why publications and um, having like um, photography or uh, photography as art exhibitions are important and not just um, photojournalism kind of programs although that's um, that can be part of it too. Uh, it's still very complicated, I think, in here. It's still very important for every photographer to have his own publication, even in a group publication. It's the, they doesn't need to have a personal one. But I think in Tunisia, for example, uh, it's still complicated because from one side it's expensive, from the other we have lack of uh, funding to do that but also we don't have uh, editors. It's starting, we have now uh, an editor who is starting this initiative, but it's still very difficult to, um, for, for photo books on, on the local market. Uh, people are not that interested into buying photo books. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, we have a lot of issues like from editors and then from photographers who may be not always seeking to have that uh, but the ones who are looking to have their own publication are facing uh, issues finding uh, fundings. Uh, but when they do, finding issues into distributing uh, the books. But I think Marwa have countered that by finding a very, and I think, genius uh, idea of they, she's not um, publishing like very fancy and expensive books. She found like a middle ground to that. Uh, and I think I have almost the whole collection of Marwa, hoping to buy the rest uh, soon. Uh, I think that uh, if that um, continues into uh, other countries, that would be great, I think. If in here, it's, it's maybe cheaper money-wise in Egypt, because we don't have the infrastructure for it, uh, or even in Algeria and Morocco, even though Algeria have um, started doing that as well. But I think if we do connect and we do link these kind of initiatives to other countries to help each other, let's, for example, publish 
uh, the photo books in Egypt and maybe do something else in Morocco uh, and helping each other would, would help us grow the market. Yeah, and um, Mara, you, you run um, a, a photo festival in um, Cairo. Can you talk a little bit about it and your experiences there? And uh, without the curators, without the teachers, without the um, photo festivals, it's very difficult to sort of infiltrate a very powerful market. Um, so um, that's the reason we thought we'd start with that conversation. Um, Mara, can you speak a little bit about um, what it's been like to um, run that program, why you started um, the festival, um, what inspired you, what your difficulties have been, things like that? Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much for having me. Um, uh, I just want to recap on what Olfa just said. Uh, could you allow me, before I go to the festival, uh, I want to recap on what was Olfa mentioning regarding the photo books. Um, uh, the low budget uh, photo books, uh, it, was, uh, it was very easy to sell, but the, whole pro uh, but the whole idea was inspired by Café Royale. Uh, it's a series of uh, very, very low budget photo books printed in London, printed in England somehow, somewhere. And, I was, and, when, and when I was visiting in 2016, I bought the whole, I mean, I bought a big portion, a big number of the series uh, from the Photographer's Gallery in London. And this is where I got the idea of publishing a budget size, like half, like this size, uh, like half an A4, uh, an A5 size uh, photo books. Uh, I just want to give credit to Café Royale for this brilliant idea and he is uh, and he's a British uh, photographer and curator. I forgot his name now, but it's a very old series of photo books, low budget, all black, uh, all in, uh, all in uh, white and black, all in black and white. Mm. Uh, we printed it in a bit uh, higher quality and in colors, but it sold very well. Uh, because it was affordable and um, it was a great successful on the pilot phase but we could not continue due to the uh, due to the political situation in Egypt it's uh, I don't think it had anything to do with the funding it was mostly due to the political situation mm -hmm. and I want to as well uh, uh, highlight the fact that um, because Cairo Photo Week the festival it, it counted mainly on sponsors, not on donors. So again, um, um, commenting on, on, on like Olfa's very, very important point that we are lacking funding. Yes, we do lack funds, but um, also funds, uh, let's be honest, some of them, they come with an agenda, all right? So it again, uh, it dictates uh, a specific, project or agenda or theme to uh, um, to use that fund in. So, so, so I think using commercial sponsors, I know some of the, most of the art scene find it a bit, uh, I don't know, uh, offensive or not appealing to use uh, private, uh, maybe private like companies or, uh, or local, uh, I don't know, people who can actually support such. So it, it definitely eliminates um, the agenda part. And normally they never dictate anything. So you basically we have uh, the fund to support, I mean, the sponsorship fund to support was uh, with way, way, way less complications. And it's, just, I mean, I call it, um, it's like a local support. So, um, it gives us full freedom to bring in, um, to support an exhibition, to uh, the operation costs of, uh, of, like, of something as big as Cairo Food Week. Um, what else? And uh, I also count on the embassies and the cultural centers and the, and the cultural centers um, linked to each embassy. And again, they normally don't, they don't dictate a specific uh, direction or like agenda. So yes, Cairo Photo Week, um, it's, uh, 
it's a conclusion of back in 2018, we launched the first edition of Cairo Photo Week. Uh, it, and it was um, the fruit of uh, working back then for seven years or six years in photography education. And then in 2021, we launched, uh, we had the second edition and it's 70% education, 10 days of education, panels, talks, uh, anything that, it's, that, that that's linked to the image industry, uh, the, the photography, in, uh, it's either still photography, videography, filmmaking, sometimes cinematography, and uh, photo editing, and maybe it's one of the unique festivals that actually address um, documentary journalism and commercial photography. So uh, we host speakers from the fashion photography scene, the food photography, and so on and so forth. I call it a local, uh, I, I like to count on, on local speakers, local instructors, um, and I mean local original, maybe from Tunisia, from, uh, um, from Lebanon, uh, from Jordan, like uh, we have lots of interesting countries in um, uh, in the Arab world who, uh, or in Africa, let's call it Africa now, uh, Tunisia and the whole, uh, I want to expand to, um, and the ghetto knows that, that I want to expand to uh, South Africa and have it. So I want Cairo Photo Week to be uh, one of the most important African festivals, maybe one day international, I don't know, but it's mainly about education and 30% exhibitions. And, and again, we focus on featuring um, only um, local names, um, Egyptian photographers, or, or, like, or like any, we had actually people from Tunisia last time uh, in, in, exhibiting their work. We had from Jordan, we had from, uh, and we had from Africa, so yes, and then we invite international speakers. We had, for instance, Maggie Stieber flying in from the US uh, to give education and to fill in the gaps that we cannot fill by local instructors. But we don't count mainly on the international names because I, again, I like the idea of, I don't know how to call it. It's not recycling, but like um, teaching the locals and then, then the locals start teaching the rest of the locals. I want to, by time and over time, uh, stop counting on uh, international, uh, the international scene uh, due to the same reason we, have, we are like having this panel. So yes, it was 10 days uh, in the heart of downtown Cairo. We had 100 and something talks and panels and 10 workshops and many, many portfolio reviews. So yes. So and you can learn about, more about it on our website. When, um, when, when does Cairo Photo Festival happening? Um, somebody's asking. Uh, it happens every two years. Uh, so uh, it's like a Biennale. And uh, it, the upcoming one would be on 2023. And I'm actually willing to, I wish that Golfa and uh, we, we expand more and we bring in more people from Africa and, uh, and North Africa next time. Yes. That would be great. Um, that, um, uh, what really inspired you to create that? Again, it's because uh, I think we have a very powerful festival in South Africa and we have another one in, uh, in Ethiopia by Aida. I'm not sure yeah. that, that the title of the festival, yeah. that's my fault. Uh, it's, we have very, very, uh, we have a very minimal number of festivals in, in like Africa and we can't count on international ones to be exposed. We need to expose our people and allow curators and international maybe uh, agencies or um, international platforms who want to hire uh, Egyptian photographers to fly in and meet them in person as opposed to the opposite. Yeah. Um, we have to have a so hand. Yes, um, it's true. And I think thinking about um, jumping off from um, the things you've talked about, I wanted to um, move to inviting Jim um, to the conversation because you are a co-founder of Nest Collective um, in Nairobi. Um, is that 
correct? And um, uh, to ask you to um, talk about your experience building that incredible organization, because it is not only image producers who are part of your collective, but also thinkers um, and critics and, and other people um, who contribute to the project that you are building. And um, you have a wide variety of image um, based or lens based um, work that you do, right? Um, over to you. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, we I work at the NES Collective, which has been running since 2012. Um, and we work with all kinds of mediums, but I think just to kind of immediately kind of tighten this into the photography section, um, I think we, we have learned very fast that, that images are, are, are considered like almost like weapons in a culture war. Um, and that imagery has been used against Africa for decades, almost centuries. Uh, to frame us, to frame our lands, to frame our culture, to frame our societies. And all that framing has always been about making us less human. Um, the word we use is meat, uh, because meat has no emotions, meat has no feelings, meat does not need dignity. Um, and so when you, even that image that you just shared from New York Times, who for me are such villains in this story of image making and Africa, um, the fact that that um, the photo editors can choose an image where people are stepping over bodies and then like there's such a such a cruelty in that act um, and I think we've learned that that if you are making images in Africa you're either complicit in making images that that position Africa as this place that is you know, populated by the three, you know, the tripod of poverty, disease, war, or you are pushing against that just by photographing things that are joyful and human and about people. Um, so I think one of the depressing things that you learn very quickly as someone who makes images of any kind, not just photography, even film, anything that's related to, to picturing African lives on a lens, um, those, that line of meat, is always kind of hanging out in the background. Um, and how do you push back against that? You are right to say that it's such a super structural hegemony. I think you use the word image regime. Um, and I think all of us here know what it takes to overthrow a regime. Um, <laughs> if, I, mean, we, I mean, we often talk about uh, through overthrowing political regimes, but what does it take to overthrow an image regime, an aesthetic regime, a cultural regime? That positions us as less than human. I wish I knew. So I think a lot of. <laughs> I know. Yeah, I, think... I know. Tunisia knows right now. They're really feeling it. <laughs> when it comes to politics, maybe. Uh, but when it comes to the ph photography, I wish I knew. But I think I've always felt like the tools are the same. Um, because the enemy is also the same, the enemy that divides um, Africa. And I think even this divide between North Africa, Sub Saharan Africa, all those are just lines that have been drawn by the British and you know, all these uh, Eurocentric kind of governments and policies that kind of strengthen those lines between us. Because for instance, the, the, the region called MENA has never really made sense to me, Middle East and North Africa. I'm like, why is it necessary for a piece of Africa to kind of be separated from the rest? Um, and that's just language religion is what it's seemingly about. But I think the, that those lines between African regions, and then we are all treated the same because to, to the New York Times, brown, black, yellow bodies are the same. Um, if there's a terrorist attack and you're lying on the streets, they will photograph that and the photo editors will find that actually quite useful to publish in their papers. Um, one of the big fights that we've had with the New York Times has been about publishing very graphic images from, from terrible moments in other countries' histories. They don't do the same for America and for Canada and for Europe because there's this idea that white bodies are way more, are more, are more deserving of dignity, are more deserving of protection. And then black bodies, Afghanistan bodies, Syrian bodies, you can just publish anything. And the rationale is that you're, you're making the horror of the world more visible to Eurocentric audiences. And I, I don't understand why Eurocentric, these audiences need graphic images from the rest of the world in order to understand that the world is is not a happy safe place you know for everyone um 
Yeah, so I think that's my that's kind of my lens on this whole issue. It makes me really angry and I'm trying to stay calm in this whole talk because a lot of the villains that I've met in my past as a photographer and as a as an image maker have been mentioned here. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think and I guess sorry, I just saw a question in the QA about like how images of trash uh, can be useful to people who are kind of studying. Um, I see someone in the, in the Q and A says that they study the politics of waste and rubbish in various African contexts, and that for them these images are useful to show the students. My question becomes: Why is it that there are universities in America that can study the politics of waste and rubbish in various African contexts? Um, why is there not an African university that can study the, the reverse? Why is it that those images have to be created by? by you know those experts that we talk about the expert photographers the, the expat workers in the in the continent if such images must be used to study can they at least be made by the people who live in those contexts and i don't mean experts or tourists or all those other funny names that white people call themselves when they're on the continent <laughs> um when you're talking about you know the um politics of quote, recycling or um, treating trash. There are politics to treating trash right here in North America or in Europe, Eurocentric countries. And to look at the way that, for instance, North Americans and Europeans export their rubbish to other countries. And those are politics that the students can study just as well. Um, and w one doesn't need to keep, and. Um, if you're studying the politics of um, rubbish, which is fine, like go ahead and do that. Um, and how, how we kind of, um, <laughs> but it doesn't have to be accompanied by degradation of the people who are destitute because the images clearly show that destitution because the audience who sees it are so far distant from that experience um, it reinforces superiority, that cultural superiority that goes with um, the immediate reaction that usually comes with images like that is, oh, look at those poor people. And those poor people is often very adjacent to those poor savage people or those poor savages and not the people. And that's where I, I think the trouble is because you are taking students with um, very little experience with that kind of um, environment and the socio-politics of um, rubbish um, I, because they haven't gone to a rubbish dump in their own country nor seen what's going on um, you know how uh, America for instance ships all that rubbish out and so but um, exactly. with, yeah without having the conversation internally um, or visiting a rubbish dump right here um, you're going to show images of people who are um, poor, poor and um, doing this work. And it is in, uh, immediately a conversation about othering. And othering always builds a superiority in those who are viewing those images. And so you're reproducing the same kind of racial hierarchies without possibly intending to. So you, um, you don't need to show those images. Um, you can show some rubbish. And you can talk about the people who are doing the work of um, trying to earn an income from it, but next to also our own conversations about how what we are doing, because there are people walking down my street collect, trying to find recycling um, right here in New York State. So there's um, there's photographs of that that you can find, or in fact, um, take them yourself if those people actually consent to having those photographs taken, and which is another issue because a lot of times nobody's ever even imagined um, why they must ask for consent from those photographs and consent can consent even be possible given the power difference between a European photographer who comes to photograph people working in a rubbish dump. Um, and, exactly. Yeah, can you, can you even, you know, first of all, have that conversation? So one of the questions I wanted to direct to you, Jim, um, quickly is to also talk about the fact that, you know, one of the things I remember, um, of, you know, in 2016, um, or no, not 2016, but um, when um, there was a um, attack at a mall in Nairobi and the New York Times photo editor chose particular photographs 
that were absolutely would never be shown had that um, those killings in a very public space. It was a terrorist attack. Would it would it have ever been shown um, in in an American setting? Because the photographs actually showed people who had just been killed and in a very very violent way, and they were on the front pages, and those families of those who were deceased had not even been informed of their deaths yet. And the complication here is that it was not a North American or European white photographer. It was a photographer who was Kenyan, I believe. Um, and I want to kind of speak about the fact that it is not just the photographer who has the power to choose because it is the photo editor who in fact has the power, the international desk person. And so often the photographer themselves do not have the kind of capacity to direct what will end up being shown. They too are trying to make a living. Um, so I wanted to, um, to have you address that and how you as a community dealt with it, because I think that was one of the few times, one of the you know, early moments in which a publication as powerful as the New York Times, which would have never listened to our critique before, suddenly had to pay attention because they realized like people in Nairobi are on the internet and have Twitter, you know? So before it was like, we publish whatever, nobody else sees it and we can, we can direct the conversation and depict you in whatever way. And suddenly they were faced with a whole like a bee swarm of people who were going to make sure that their voices were heard. Um, so yeah, I mean, just to recap quickly, there was, there was a terrorist attack in Kenya, in Nairobi, uh, one in January, I think it was 20, oof, it was a couple of years ago. And yes, you're right, the New York Times, there was a whole bunch of photographers. And the thing about photographing a scene like that is that you, you see photographers running into, uh, you know these scenes where there's been an explosion or whatever and they're just kind of running the cameras at like you know whatever how many frames per rate and they're just kind of it's almost like it's almost like firing you know a machine gun to just kind of shooting and running through the space so on some level i do understand that photographers entering such a space are not thinking about the ethics the morality of what they're shooting they are rather just kind of running into the space photographing and then being herded about by policemen and the attacks are going on with you know so it's a crazy situation so there are a lot of people who say but why why did the photographer take those gruesome images i'm like it's like a war situation right so calm down the people who then receive these images from photographers and choose those images, those are the people I have a problem with because they are sitting there in their air conditioned offices in New York, choosing images and they, and you are right to say that they know the history of images, they, they understand visual language. So they cannot be said to, have to be under the same kind of duress to make uh, choices about images. Um, and that is why I had a problem with New York Times. So yes, you're right that they did take, they did finally have to take notice after, after days and days of protests from Kenyans. But for me, that still worries me because how much effort, how many tweets? Because, you know, people have jobs to do, right? They're not, they're not paid to be on Twitter, right? But they're here on Twitter making memes, making angry tweets, retweeting, that is work, that is the labor. And which takes me to the question of labor. How much labor goes into teaching Europe and America empathy? It is not the work of, of the global South to teach the global North empathy. It is not our work to explain the injustice of the world to them, but they make that our work, right? So those hours spent on Twitter by Kenyans explaining to the New York Times that this image is distressing because there are people who found out that their relatives died because people sent them links to that article. Is that a way to find out that someone you love died? You know, an image of someone slumped over a table surrounded by chaos and bullets and blood. Is that how you want to find out that someone you love died? And why does the New York Times think that we are so feelingless, we have no empathy, we have no human emotion, that we can find out about something like that in that way and just be like, oh, thank you for letting me know. That's not how life works, right? And it took days of tweeting for Kenyans to explain that. And still, the New York Times have kept that image on that article. They are still um, there. I checked. Exactly. Um, yeah. And I don't want to even 
approach showing it. That's not even a question because yeah. all you're doing is um, giving um, space to an image that dehumanizes our <laughs> uh, the very thing that we're yeah. trying. Yeah. And, um, and the one thing that maybe I can share is this ridiculous, like, lengthy article that they wrote um, explaining their decision, and I posted it here in the chat. That conversation was really insulting to me for a bunch of Americans to be sitting around in New York explaining to themselves, having this very naval gazing conversation about why they should publish things to make their readers. Why does the New York Times think that they're not a global media company? At the same time, they're advertising here in Kenya, subscribe to the New York Times. Who are those who are subscribing to New York Times? If you're advertising to the whole world and saying subscribe to us, then please treat your audience as a global audience. Don't have different policies for American readers and another one for international, all the other people, right? And that article, they have that ridiculous discussion where they're saying that, you know, maybe, maybe we should think through having, you know, like one policy for the whole world. And I'm like, why? Why would you publish such a ridiculous article? Why would you make us read this and say this is our apology? So I don't know. I, this, I told you this thing makes me angry. So maybe let me just take a minute to it's calm okay. down. It is a, it is a place <laughs> of passionate discussion. It's good. Um, <laughs> we don't want our audience falling asleep about all the technical stuff. <laughs> <we're going on. laughs> but so I, I guess then that. my final question would be, all those people who tell us that these images are useful to teach their audiences show us the evidence of that lesson right all these in all these centuries of looking at images of, of people from other countries afghanistan syria all these countries where they have been brutalized by america what has the images from those situations has that have they made an america better have they made america less warlike no you remember those terrible images they sent from Abu Ghraib, where the, the, the soldiers were found doing those disgusting things with prisoners there did that make America better? No. These images of trash that you're showing your students to teach them about, about trash, does it make your students realize that America is not in the business of, does not actually recycle, that it sends its old clothes, old computers, trash to Africa, and then that becomes our dump sites. And then now you want to come and photograph those and say, we were studying African trash. No, so I, I, I want evidence. I want to see what these images are doing to your people because I don't see it in the ways that you guys design your immigration policies. Your, you know, it's just crazy. Yeah, yeah. The, um, if you can't um, produce some tangible results for this um, idea that it has changed or challenged, um, and then also be accompanying this so-called educate educative power of, um, I think what many people do is to say this this photographs have an educative power just like you know literature teachers like me are told like books have an educative power i've been teaching for 18 years i don't know if books have an educative power <laughs> every every time i'm crying at the end of it wondering like did i teach three people and um did i did i from like 35 people in my class did i even get something across the three people in the class and I find that that argument that um, images have this educative power to uh, it's true they are very images are powerful that's why um, images have been um, photographs have forever since the beginning dawn of photography they have always been part of the racist project or the colonial project or the whatever project or imperial projects um, just like photography has been bound to um, US invasion of Afghanistan, Iraq, or Libya for that matter, to justify why um, as, as you know, a very reasonable project. So we continue to kind of say images are very educative. They are, they continue to teach us racist S-H-I-T. Um, and why not, you know, like I, I think we can swear, I'm sure there's no children here and no very sensitive people. Um, um, so uh, I, I, I know that they are educative, but um, if they are educating people to continue um, with racist kind of um, educations that reinforce their racist educations that we've all grown up with, because we all grow up with white supremacy as a central part of our upbringing, because it is a global culture and images are part of that global culture um, of white supremacy and what we're talking about are all the photo festivals 
all the publications, all the curation, uh, curate, curatorial people, the management, the projects like the Nest Collective, um, uh, places like um, Market Photo Workshop that um, Le Ghetto used to be a part of, and galleries like the Javits Center where he is currently part of, that are trying to counter that hegemony or that um, image repertoire, which is um, a very powerful image repertoire, um, and how to kind of counter it when resources are lacking um, and we need more, more, more is what I've always seen. Um, and it's also very difficult to um, get um, platforms that have funding and money like a New York Times to hire a local photographer to begin with and not send somebody in to parachute in who doesn't know the local conditions. But then it's also how do you change the minds of um, or, or affect a photo editor because you may have a local photographer who's um, Tunisian, Kenyan, Cairo, from Cairo itself, from the city itself, but the photo editor is the one with power to do this. Um, I, the photograph of um, LeBron James, which I've shown to my students, they were so shocked that LeBron James himself did not have the power to change or challenge um, Vogue editor, um, you know, depiction of him in that demeaning way. Um, because they were like, what do you mean? LeBron, you know, started a school. <laughs> He's very rich. Um, he's a global icon, why can't he do this? And part of it, maybe LeBron may not have even, um, you know, known how he was going to be depicted. Um, and nobody's asking why G Giselle Bunchen didn't ask for that. That's another thing, like, why is Giselle not protesting? This is a terrible way to depict the person with um, which I'm um, being photographed and imaged and I'm, I'm going to be there for a global public to consume on the cover of Vogue. Um, so th th I think in a many ways that we've talked about building those local infrastructures is one of the most important things to do. Um, uh, and, and, and creating those kind of networks between ourselves and then reaching out to those, um, you know, partners, whether in North America, Latin America, in, in East Asia, Europe, um, and, and Arab countries to partner with um, a more kind of ethical, conscious, and very careful way of imaging our own um, kind of worlds. Um, Leketo, you're back with electricity, so I want to quickly get you to join in before anything happens again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm analog now. So. Yeah, so I had to connect on my phone. So yeah, I, I've got I, I was able to catch um, parts of of the presentations or the sharing of the conversations, and um, yes, I mean the reality is that we cannot teach um, Europe. Um, anything uh, they have to find in themselves to reflect self reflect and 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 relearn and that process they will unlearn quite a lot of lot of uh, things that are that are they've been breastfed over the many years because the 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 excursion the colonial excursion using the camera uh, which which I think what happened was images became um, weaponized to really illustrate a power over the global south and and with the history of photography, last chunk of it was images produced of the global south in the most demeaning way. That's why anthropology and ethnographic kind of uh, uh, language of, of fauna and flora, where within that fauna and flora description, uh, the global south humans are also represented, meaning that there is an element of subhuman. Peter McKenzie, um, may he so rest in peace, um, puts it beautifully when he he designed this curriculum, which um, kind of illustrates the, the, the four epochs in, in his own description uh, of photography in Africa. So in a sense, he's, he's saying to us, we need to begin to define how we see photography, um, how we use the tool, how we learn how to construct images from our own cultural um, and lived experiences. So he speaks about the dehumanization uh, epoch, which was quite hard, where, 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 the, where the, it's predominantly white male 
I mean, that, that should be kind of something that is clearly we put out there, came out to the Global South as on an excursion of game, you know, uh, photographing. And that you can see, um, I mean, I'm sorry to say this, is, is a, many people are seeing it as a beautiful South African movie, movie The Bang Bang Club, uh, where these white males really, you know, get this urge and, and excitement and adrenaline of going into the apartheid township um, violated spaces to photograph um, uh, people being killed, people killing each other, the, the soldiers beating people in the most horrific graphic way. And they come out, you know, as trophies. And that reflects the presence of a European male in the global south. And unfortunately, because of these images for many years being used as illustration, many of these uh, editors uh, who are possibly majority wise are over 50, uh, have taught other younger uh, um, editors how to think about images regionally. So generally across the board, images that come from the global south are not ethical at all in terms of, of choice. But also if it's somebody that's parachuted to come into photographing the global south, there's a type of images that they're always looking out for. And these things, I mean, it's, it, the more we travel, the more we engage in different platforms globally, you begin to realize that, you know, there's a bigger need for, 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 for us to recognize that people are naive, uh, people are un un uneducated, uneducated um, in spaces that we think these are really highly regarded spaces. You know, there's a whole lot of growth that Europe needs to do by itself. Uh, but in meanwhile, what Mara is doing, what, what, what uh, Orpha is doing, um, I mean, across what we are doing across the continent, I think is something that we, we, we need to begin to invest our energies in. We know very well that in terms of the politics and understanding of the role of, of, of images within, within our continent and, and at the arts in general, we still have a long way to go in, in really getting our political uh, representatives to really begin to think differently about it because without identities, without us really uh, bringing dignity back into our, our, our lives as humans of this continent uh, through these this types of, of uh, uh, forums and platforms and practices, we are going to take, it's, it's going to take us quite a long time to really begin to be a proud, um, diverse continent. So networks are critical. Um, studying our own kind of curriculum is important. We're not locking out the rest of the world. I think the rest of the world has a role to play because we want to define going forward. I mean, I loved, I don't know if you guys seen the speech by the Prime Minister of Barbados yesterday. Yes. Which was quite powerful. Oh. And I think it embodies what we are talking about, that we have to be equal humans across the globe. And in thinking, because we have ideas, we have intentions, we have agencies, and we have a want to really begin to define the image making uh, within our own context, in, within our own understanding, in how we bring our cultures, our languages into play when we talk about images. But again, you know, for me, the networks, for example, six years ago, we, we established what we call the Centers for Learning of Photography in Africa, which is a very, very important uh, virtual network. Um, unfortunately, because I left the photo workshop, I'm not actively participating in it, but I think it's a beautiful way of, of, of understanding um, the, the challenges that we have faced across the continent, because obviously we still, uh, uh, some of us celebrating the, the colonial, uh, um, regional, you know, anglophone, you know, that rubbish, anglophone, francophone, uh, portugophone. I don't know why we're still celebrating, because it was a huge fight a month or so ago in the Pan-African Parliament, where the anglophones were fighting against the, uh, the francophone. So very stupid. You know, but how do to, to networks such as the Centers for Learning of, of Photography begin to break um, these this colonial walls for us to really recognize that we are, you know, awesome? I know. And thanks. I, <laughs> thanks so much, Keto. <laughs> Jim, you didn't even have to apologize for getting, um, you know, um, passionate because... <laughs> We're here to do that. The, I think I want to add, like, um, Gilles Flick is here. Um, uh, Gilles, hi, hi, Gilles. And um, I, before we open up for um, audience questions and to address audience questions, I wanted to um, say she, she has added a comment saying, don't forget there's the patriarchal gaze and a patriarchal lens that also accompanies this, you know, um, Eurocentric or white or racist lens that we're talking about because that is a big part of how um, 
people are being visualized um, wherever uh, it is. And the other part, I think that the Bang Bang Club, again, I think when you talk to the surviving photographers, they were working under conditions that were very, very fraught. And many of the photographers um, whose work I'm writing about from the 1980s, they really do talk about the fact that they produce images and it is essentially who wants to publish which image. And uh, it's not, uh, the movie is, I think, obviously an exaggeration and, and a not, a, um, it does not um, <laughs> do justice to the real lives of the uh, photographers. They dramatized and essentially, you know, created it for a, um, I think, largely Western audience too. Um, but, or whoever audience um, to make it exciting, but those, re the real lives of the photographers and how you work means that you're trying to make um, a living and those who um, buy your images and choose which images, this was a huge struggle for the photographers from the 1980s um, in South Africa that what you photographed, um, it's not necessarily your kind of images of compl complicated images with layers of um, thought um, that were being bought and published because you um, photo editors want to publish an image with a two dimensionality because it gets that message across and that's what people buy and what people buy meaning which people are we talking about you know essentially images that were being sent to the netherlands to germany to england and some to north america because those were the channels that were being used um, they wanted a very black and white kind of conversation through those images to be depicted and so that you would always see the same kinds of ways in which um, black resistance was photographed, not as something with dignity and power, but as something that um, made black persons resisting apartheid to look more, quote, again, savage. And of course they made um, white apartheid police look savage too, but the everyday persons resisting the violence of the state to create them as a kind of monolithic um, you know, um, violent um, lineup of black people um, already creates a problem. Um, also, you have your hand up and I'll let you have the last word before we let um, our audience have um, their words. Uh, sorry, maybe before, before Alpha, uh, just, just to pick up on one of you, one of you just made, the, the reflection of the bank club and, and, and the photographers who are supposedly being represented in that film, to say that we, we, we do have photographers mainly black, your Bongani Mgunis, you know, your Santi Mufu Kings, who photographed the struggle, who photographed the hardships, but the most human ways. Those images never made it out. Yes, Gilles' work was not going to be as popular as um, some of these um, kind of what we call spectacular images, because the spectacular images sold, whereas Gilles' work or um, Desney Mudlia's um, images um, a Indian, uh, a person of Indian descent, a photographer of Indian descent from Durban, for instance, their photographs are very, very beautiful and nuanced, and they're not the um, women who are remembered um, for their depictions of uh, apartheid and or, or survival and and incredible struggle and incredible dignity and incredible um, strategizing, because you know as we know black and brown people don't strategize because that requires intellect. So strategy is not being shown. Um, we're just shown like resisting violently. <laughs> Because that's what you know we do. So um, I think you know, like Gilles' photographs and Desney's photographs, very, very clearly show that organizing, very powerful women, um, voting, um, you know, doing petitions, going in the communities, and that's none of that is really there. Um, uh, they are existing, and I'm so glad to be able to write about those photographers because I want a platform for them and those images as well. So Ulfa, um, please. It's just to go back to this is issue of struggle between the photographer and when he takes photographs of his own country in a like national event or like in, in any event actually, and then how the editor is using it. 
I think the photographer is not only to blame because he's always put in a position where he needs to choose between making uh, this as his day job and getting paid for this, but then how the editor is going to use it. Let's not forget that most of the images uh, are full text. Uh, and sometimes uh, the, the image doesn't speak uh, the text. Like, I've, I think in Tunisia, also imagine in Egypt, this has been going on for a while since uh, what they like to call the Arab Spring. Uh, as a great example of this, lately Tunisia have witnessed a coup. Uh, and now today we have a lot of local photographers who uh, actually uh, have the chance to, to give their opinion through the images uh, and they work for whether local agencies or international ones. Uh, and all the images that have been sold around this coup is people applauding and, and partying outside, but then the title said otherwise. So this is also something like to debate as well. So all of the European and American news have been trying to uh, Said, uh, say otherwise about this coup while all the Tunisian people have been have been happy about what's happening. All the foreign media have been trying to communicate to the world that this is bad and uh, it's uh, scandalous and Tunisia is, is living, um, is witnessing like a very sensitive period and they are driven out from democracy. But I think that uh, since 2011, Tunisia have never really lived in a real democracy and this is something they never uh, wanted to address to their larger audience. So let's not forget that this is not only the photographer um, responsibility, but also the agency, the manager, the people that who are seeing these images, the editors, the magazines, and everyone involved in this like uh, circle of, um, of photojournalism. Yes. Um, thank you so much, everybody. Should we open to the um, questions? Or Mara, do you want to add something quickly? Yeah, it's, it's not a problem. No, um, no. Of time. All right. And, and I, I want to say that we need to quit the victim mode of being. Uh, it's very, very important to tackle the issue and to highlight it. But we need to uh, all quit this mode and start networking actively, uh, all as whatever that we do, each one of us, and invite more and more and more people. To, uh, to start building uh, the right uh, narrative and we start to dictate uh, our own uh, narrative and our own um, uh, representation of the African uh, uh, narrative and using their, I mean, and, and like hiring local photographers and counting on local educators and counting on being fully self-sufficient uh, on that matter in terms of funding, in terms of education, in terms of agencies, exhibitions, uh, art festivals. Uh, and I think Africa can, really. It's just, it's Africa. It's the, it's the most talented continent in the world. I believe so. So uh, yes, we have everything. We have all the talents. We are so smart. We are so powerful. We have the resources. So I think yes. it's about time to be self-sufficient and work together, no matter what uh, the, the white uh, feel or act or react, it's, just, it's about time. We are in the digital era, so I think every single barrier is over. We, we, we don't even need to travel, all right? So okay. this is my final take on that. We need to stop complaining and just and just attack okay <laughs> and attack back that's it just it could sound a bit uh, utopian but i um, but i believe in that so much and in many ways that's the reason why i, I love um being able to talk and bring us all together is because you're my heroes of the attack because you're already doing it <laughs> you you've already been doing it we're just um kind of putting it out in the world about all the kind of resources that we've made available, in fact, um, when there weren't resources or not very many resources available. These are homegrown um, solutions that we've ourselves created because nobody was going to build centers for us. Nobody was going to make us a nest collective. 
<laughs> you know, or a Cairo Photo Festival, or, um, you know, um, give us opportunities to curate or um, uh, make market photo what it is today um, and to kind of direct uh, uh, the Java Art Center uh, to focus on, on black photographers from Africa, the way that we are doing. Um, and that, that's, for me, that is exciting to talk to um, people who are actually working while we can talk about the problems. You are actually, of course, solution makers and not just solution makers, people who have in fact, um, you know, given us tools to keep on working with. Um, Jim, you have your hand up. Uh, yes, to that point of, um, of, of how, I think someone asked this question earlier on how do you take down a regime, right? I, for me, like this, this, this element of the building, but there's also the taking down. I think there is significant work that needs to go into the taking down of oppressive structures, as well as building the structures that we want to see. So it's amazing for me to see like all the initiatives, the photo festivals, the, the printing and all that. But then who is doing the work of, of saying no? Because for me, it's not just about the victim complex. It's also that you dishonor us by printing, printing terrible images of us. That we were not consulted about, you know. And when you refuse, when you try and refuse to to grant these uh, photojournalists licenses because you know your publications are a problem, it becomes an issue of you are restricting free press. But that's not what that's not what the, <laughs> that's not what's really going on here. Um, and so, who, like we just talked about just now, the New York Times are slowly learning that when you publish ridiculous photos. From the, from the other half of the world, you're going to get in trouble online. And there are people who believe that that kind of, that those moments are actually good for the New York Times because then everyone wants to go and see the article and see what, what, what is this you know, crisis about. But I think whose work is it to make it difficult for America and Europe to operate the way they want in the other half of the world? Someone has to do that work. Someone has to do the angry tweets. Someone has to do the angry letters. Someone has to take them to the media councils and tell them we can't do this. And, and that's really hard work. It's ugly work. It's annoying work. It's tiring work. And it also doesn't have resources. But we must make room for that kind of work if we're going to take down oppressive aesthetic regimes. Yeah. And um, if it isn't being, if that con those conversations, I, I mean, I'm really interested in that idea that you brought up that this is a labor and that labor is not paid or compensated. And it's often denigrated as like those angry people are at it again. And now we have to pay attention, you know, so our, our labor is also not only uncompensated, we're also like denigrated for even beginning a conversation like that. Um, it's not a welcome conversation at all, even though, um, you know, those PR blurbs that always say, we always welcome um, uh, robust conversations. And I, I, I know that um, language so well because I teach writing and I know exactly what robust is meant to kind of cover up. <laughs> it means like, oh, we um, go ahead and challenge us and we'll end up choosing depending on how much damage we can, you know, avoid. Um, and if I, we can avoid people kind of uh, forcing us to um, change something because we look bad and that will affect our bottom line, then, yeah. Um, so we have- Looking bad is interesting. Yeah, go uh, ahead. Because even I remember during the fight we were having in the New York Times, um, a lot of people who are the most prominent in terms of writing these angry tweets, I remember being told, Jim, you shouldn't attack the New York Times so strongly because you're gonna need them in the future. You're an artist, your work is going to need visibility, and the New York Times are not going to write about your shit because they remember that you're that guy who was making angry videos about them. So, I mean, there's such a power dynamic there that's really troubling. It's like you're not even allowed to be annoyed because then you risk your career. And I'm like, okay, fine. I was put on this earth with the gifts I have. And if, and if being angry about being dishonored means that my career has to suffer. I think, you know, that's just the reality of the war. Yeah, we, I mean, I'm sure a couple of us at least have lost some opportunities because of our strong, robust critiques. I would definitely, I'd be in that list of people who can 
um, you know, specifically tell um, speak about the robust critiques that have lost me some opportunities, letters of recommendation, people are on boards for things. Um, so yeah, I'm, 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 I, but I, you know, yay, I haven't yet gone to, you know, I haven't disappeared yet, but I'm sure there's enough people wishing that Jim Chichu would just disappear and then um, because he, he's going to be shouting at the Nest Collective again. Um, uh, I'm sorry, going to be the Nest Collective is going to be shouting at the New York Times again. So I, I would love for people to um, please um, type in any questions. We already have three um, significant questions on, um, uh, on the Q&A. Um, what do you think photographers, um, this is Aaron Emeni, um, um, what do you what do you think photographers based in the US can do to push back on these images? Um, even if I write an article calling out the behavior, it feels like I'm spinning my wheels because it happens again and again. Yes. So that's why this labor feels futile. And um, Jim was essentially saying it it takes the dual kind of parts of labor. One is to kind of um, destroy the or attack that um, regime, but also to build a different kind of image world, um, both of them. And it does feel futile. I don't know what you all um, feel like or what you do. I think it has helped me to create community like this and to create networks internally, that it is a slow process. Um, no revolutions are won in one go, even though the spectacular moment of the revolution looks very beautiful and it's very photogenic. It's the work afterwards and we have many setbacks, like every revolution, I think. Um, but it is an exhausting and um, uncompensated and un unrewarded kind of work. Um, anybody want to add? I, to I could add um, to that question of what does a photographer, an African photographer, or you know, whatever, whatever race you are, and you're in America, and you're wondering how do you contribute as a photographer? And writing is not your thing. Not everyone should be writing think pieces, right? Not everyone's think piece should be published, also because the whole thing there about who gets published. But America is the, one of the craziest countries in this world. I mean, the citizens are being shot by their police. They are the richest country in the world, but their, their development statistics are terrible. They have homelessness, they have all these crazy things, but then they waste so much time traveling around the world, photographing other people's dystopias. So if you're an African and you're a photographer there and you feel like you want to push back the best way, then go out and photograph the dystopia that is America because they are investing so much time in other people's, in depicting other people's dystopias so they can call us shithole countries, right? The only reason Trump is able to call us a shithole country is because he hasn't seen how bad America is. Yeah. Um, those those images are very um, rarely shown, and if they are, they're often about. Um, it's a way of speaking about images, using those images to um, put responsibility on individuals, because American politics are about individualism, and that it is not structures that are creating this kind of poverty or homelessness or, or hunger in children, for instance. It's that mother failed, um, and that's why. Um, and so I, I, even if the photographer, I think there are obviously there's articles and photography work together and you can have very intelligent discussions about how structures create those kinds of individual um, imp ex implosions, how individual lives implode in, in, uh, in, because of structural violence that we live through. Um, but that narrative of um, work hard, get rewarded is so powerful that sometimes those images only reproduce. But there are, of course, amazing photographers, um, Latina photographers, Black photographers, um, and, and many, in fact, wonderful white photographers who do this work. Um, because I don't want to say, this is not a question about white people can't photograph Black bodies, because even 2018, 19, I was having a conversation with the directors of a board, the executive director and a director of a board um, of a photography organization, a nonprofit that's very well known here that on which I was a board member and they had chosen a particular photographer who's depict a white photographer whose depiction of local um, black people in his kind of journey to explore his own racism as an Italian person. Um, but his idea was that 
I want to find the remnants of the Underground Railroad. And I was thinking, these are just photographs of poor black people in um, upstate New York. So how does this show the escape route um, during slavery? And when I brought this up to the director and the executive director, why is this particular photographer getting your resources, getting a platform, an exhibition, a talk, and a publication, an article, which is three different platforms to um, disseminate his version of what black people should be photographed to look like. And they, in the exhibition, they also included in a light box, a pair of shackles from the local historical society under bright light. And I was thinking, is this how you want to have image? This is 2018, 19. When I first asked the, you know, crucial questions of like, why is this the person you want to give a platform to? Do you not see that, um, you know, these tropes that he's using completely unconsciously because he was a very nice guy as a human person. Um, but why, as you as director and executive director, have you not been educated because you are running the show? You are the ones kind of gatekeeping what images are rewarded. And their answer was, are you saying white people can't photograph black people because that's very dangerous territory was the phrase they used. Like, um, that's dangerous censorship because that's like saying men can't photograph women. And I thought, I am educating two very powerful people in 2018 about why what we're talking about is not censorship. And also there's loads of white um, photographers running around photographing black people all the time. And there's nothing, uh, you know, we're not talking eliminating white men <laughs> from the job of photography here. Um, don't worry, you won't be like eradicated. It's not gonna happen. Um, but we are, we are still having that conversation. And I remember um, how exhausting it was. It was over a year long. The organization never changed. Uh, nothing happened. And so you, you are often feeling like you are fighting a losing battle. And in fact, I started this program <laughs> as a response to that experience because I was so angry from it. Um, and I found, I realized like they were going to roadblock me every time I asked a question by kind of speaking to me very like demi, you know, like a child who needed to be taught some basics about freedom and et cetera. And so I started this platform because of that. And in a way, like I don't even care about what they do, but they do have enormous resources. They have hundreds of thousands of dollars in the bank because organizations, um, public funding, state funding, tax funding, private donors give that organization money and to people who are completely ignorant about the relationship between race, racism and imagery are, are choosing who gets to put more images that are racist on um, into the image repertoire. Um, so I completely understand how exhausting it is, but I don't know what else to do but to continue doing the quote attack part of the revolution, as well as the production part. Of, this is the production part of the revolution. Like <laughs> this, this is it's a, it's a two part pro, two pronged attack. Let's say two pronged revolution. <laughs> um, other questions, other things people want to um, contribute. Um, Maybe just just read while we were waiting for another uh, question. Um, and I, I mean, being part of so many portfolio reviews, I think I've gone through probably ten in the past three months or so because obviously they are done uh, digitally online and it's easier to 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 not to fly like that or to to uh, to Germany or to to New York as for that. So we see more and more portfolio reviews. And and the, the reality is that there are many young um, photographer European uh, of Caucasian nature who are really you know, wanting to learn, wanting to find out, wanting to get a get a different kind of narrative perspective from how they've been kind of taught within their own, you know, yeah. uh, education systems. And and I really want to encourage ourselves because we are we have been grappling with these issues um, around uh, how we are represented. And I think uh, we have come up with our own theories, uh, with our own intentions and positions. And I think we need to that resource we need to make it accessible. So they should not be scared to reach out to learn. 
uh, because learning is is part of of evolving and and those those madala uh, male photographers who think because they've been doing it for 40 years they know everything they need to see themselves differently they're humans and learning is good learning is enriching is satisfying and we are happy to to teach if you come to us we will we will you know share a thing or two and you'll become a better person a human being <laughs> Yes, welcome. Come, come, um, come to African um, photo centers. Um, we are ready to accept your um, foreign currency um, anytime. <laughs> um, Jim, did, did you want to say something? Yeah, um, I think a lot of the questions that uh, or things that we're talking about today are about um, what happens when you commodify images. Um, and when you commodify images, then things like shock and the expediency of how those images can be used, whether it's war porn, poverty porn, disease porn, all those things kind of bubble up to the top. And so I think the question, and I think one thought that we've always had is that there's no art form that was improved by industrialization. There's no art form that was improved by commodification. Um, if you look at the fine arts, that whole art world thing is just crazy and immoral and unethical. Um, if you look at music, the biggest player in the world of music is Spotify, who pays the least to the artists. Mm -hmm. um, and so with photography, it's not going to be different. It's going to be people, like the most shocking images will, will, will earn the most money, the most, the photographs that are useful to NGOs, to the EU, their immigration policies, all this nonsense. Your images are going to be used in, thing, in ways that are difficult for you to, you know, to grapple with. So I guess the question becomes, if you're an African photographer, who wants to make money from your craft are you are you able to be to push your ethical ground at the point where someone comes and says i want to buy this image and and then it turns out that the reason your image is is valuable is because it's going to make you know an article more shocking it's going to make um it's going to make um money move somewhere you know and, and that's that, that tragedy of photography, that, that your imagery can be decontextualized, can be recontextualized, can be remixed, can be put into a context that makes your image actually very disgusting to you. Um, so I don't know, for you guys who are working in, the, in sectors where the commodification is quite close in terms of the photo books and the fairs and the festivals, where, do you, where does the shadow of commercialism meet you? And in fact, one of the questions in the main um, panel um, um, comments is Tracy Valcourt is asked, um, has pointed out that there is this huge art market that operates around images of human suffering and also racist images, to be frank, like even those garbage picking ones are within that kind of larger um, story of um, depicting um, blackness as a, something that is suffering that is destitute, that is um, less than. And um, they, it often, she's, she's written, um, it often gets confused or advanced as quote, humanitarian efforts. So as you're saying, it, it doesn't have to be like under the umbrella of um, commercial photography, you know, like, because it can be like with the, under the guise of we are doing good. Um, and that doing good often gives leeway to do lots of exploitative stuff. Like, yes. you know, I'm teaching about the politics of um, re refuse um, in the globe or, or in the global kind of context, or I'm teaching, I'm showing how um, a, a you know, particular um, group is facing famine or a child needs to be adopted. Um, and so you're, you're under the, you know, proposition of doing good, a lot of racism can happen because it's all doing good always involves a power um, imbalance and images can be um, instrumentalized for um, emphasizing that power imbalance and it can also create power imbalance or help aid that power imbalance because we keep um, justifying our reasons for um, thinking of ourselves as superior or thinking of others as inferior. Um, another uh, question, um, um, a point that somebody's made that I think is really interesting and good and strong is that um, Thomas Omondi has said, um, oops, um, somebody's trying to call me. I think that being quote racist in this day and age is something that um, he wouldn't regard as quote ignorance, but rather a confirmation of a 
problematic socialization of that individual. And I think, you know, I added to that by saying it's a very willful action rather than because there's all the articles and all the conversation isn't available, especially to those who direct um, publications, photo editors, um, photo organizations like the one I was talking about. That conversation has been around since like maybe 1990, maybe Edward Said, you know, like, so this is like not um, current as much as like it's been happening since 1975, people. So why am I still protesting the same thing? <laughs> I am, though, because obviously it's not going to happen like overnight um, just because Edward Said shows, showed images. Um, create Orientalism or, or work with Orientalism didn't mean that people stopped Orientalizing. So God help us, we're still continuing with that conversation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, Somebody has asked whether we want to form a collective <laughs> because <laughs> um, they don't want this to stop. Like what's what are some of the next steps? And maybe because we have now run over one and a half hours, um, unless people are, are resilient and want to keep going, we could um, wrap up some of our ideas. Um, uh, Margot Muir has asked this forum, was it planned to be sort of growing and structured one or a panelist informally interacting at this point? We are, we are informally interacting, but we'd love to continue um, given some, you know, things, support that we, we're trying to obtain, but that, that is difficult, I think. Um, but we, we would love to continue on and collaborate, in fact, um, towards Cairo Photo Festival and um, create that platform um, for the following year um, into something um, working towards some of what Mao was um, speaking about, in fact. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and also just to add that, I mean, as some of us here um, are, are Trojan horses. We infiltrate these, you know, these old institutions like your World Press Photo, your National Geographic, your New York Times, um, because I think the, 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 the positive is that this conversation have started in those platforms. I mean, National Geographic is one of the culprits, you know, biggest culprits in, in spreading these images and supporting such type of, of uh, outsider in, inside dropping in, you know, taking, basically taking, shooting, you know, those languages, capturing, you know, the World Press, World Press photo whom I've, 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 I've engaged with over the past three years. Um, I know that uh, when last left, he had already started um, kind of talking about a shifting, you know, this mindset of around photography in terms of what makes the best photo. You know, we come from a very violent and, and violated past. So these images of violence have always been the winning images in the World Press photo, if you look at, you know, uh, what, what the best photo has been. But off late, we're starting to see um, a different type of image that's about humanity, that, that brings dignity back to humans that are, are facing suffering. So there is that conversation. And once, once these this, this large corporates begin to shift uh, and allowing a space of the rest of the world to really engage around the, the, what, what, what makes an image, you know, how, to, how, how do people read and construct in, meaning in images, but also responsibilities of images in societies. I think they can begin to shift, you know, that commodification of images that for you to make a best image, you have to make this violent image. You know, I know that television, even if you watch, my daughter watches cartoons, she's just six, and these cartoons that are meant for her are horrific. They are very, very violent. And that violent violence begins that. And once she grows, she will regard those images in a very particular way. So as, as, as an art industry, and I think the continent, because we are growing so fast in terms of these new networks uh, that we're formalizing, Mara, you are the next platform. We're going to talk about this when you get to. We have to, to begin to, re to revolutionize what, how, engaging what pre is presented on, on public platforms such as television. Um, that then has to be a responsibility in, 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 in when it comes to issues of, of ethics. Sensitivity is critical. What types of, of societies and humans are we, are we bringing into this earth, are bringing up in this, in this, in this earth? So I think there, there's a bigger kind of human. Uh, impact conversation that we need to to have beyond just the practice yes yes um and uh some uh tracy uh valcourt has added that 
she would love to see relationships between oral history and photography rather than having images imp interpreted through institutions. Or also, I think, you know, as a writer, I know that that kind of conversation that I've been able to have with photography that also helped me co um, question my own embedded racism that I grew up with or my own kind of patriarchal constructs that despite being this mousy woman, um, <laughs> obviously I too swim in patriarchy. So those with um, speaking with others, being in collectives informally, um, as well as like a long education. And many of the first educators who got me thinking about these things were my Midwestern American white professors. And there is a place for all of us in this because um, you don't have to be tinted in your skin color <laughs> to be an anti-racist or an anti-sexist or to be a, a thinker um, as well as an image maker. Um, to tell stories that do justice to those you are telling stories about. And also doesn't compromise your own humanity because in continuing these racist kind of narratives, you compromise your own humanity, of course. Yeah. Anything else we want to add? I think there's someone who asked uh, about the new NFT trend. Oh, yes. <laughs> Um, what what are your you thoughts? Need the whole debate just for that. NFT. What NFT? Yes, uh, so the, NFT the new yeah the new Bitcoin currency, but for photography. So you can actually give uh, um, a worth to your to your image through 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 internet. Uh, it's like treat a photo like you treat a Bitcoin, which is very complicated so far. Jim has an answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was going to answer uh, from my perspective with kind of closing. Um, yes, NFTs are interesting because this question about is it possible to create value for digital assets? That's an interesting question for a world that is really moving digital and, and moving away from the object culture. Uh, so I think while, while NFTs have had their kind of viral moments and viral moments are not great for the for people to get in touch with the, the, the technology, you know, because you only get like the top notes that are most press friendly. But when you look at NFTs and this idea that digital assets can have value, I think that's an interesting thing because it allows people to kind of circumvent the object culture. So photographers don't have to stress so much about printing and paper and storage and all that other nonsense. And they're able to get some value from just the digital assets. So I think the thing that interests me most about that is the fact that is the possibility that, you know, for instance, in the art world, when you sell a print, that's the last you're going to be involved in those, those transactions. And so that, that print goes into the secondary market and then you, you find your work somewhere at like almost seven times the price, but you've only got your little transaction at the beginning. But with NFTs, you're able to do things like every time the, 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 the object changes hands, the, the artist gets a cut of that transaction. And I think that's a beautiful thought. Um, and, the, and the thought underneath that is this idea that you can decentralize and I'm very interested in this question of decentralizing because everything that is central about uh, art has been problematic. The institutions, the, the VNAs and the Sotheby's and all these problematic institutions, I'm very interested in this idea of decentralization as a thing that can help us to walk away from that. And then the last question, I just saw someone saying, what should photographers show as Africa instead of what's being shown? And I think there's another question that kind of echoes that. Um, which is uh, someone saying, uh, how, do you, how do you remain as a photographer and don't be unethical, but still be able to earn a living, which goes back to that commodification problem. I think the only answer I can give there is choose your side. Um, there is, you, you're either making, you're either building dignity for people in the global south or you're contributing to the indignity of people in the global south. And I hate to make it binary like that, but like, honestly, that's what's really going on here. And like we said, the labor of changing the world is often free. No one's gonna pay you to change the world. No one's gonna believe in your, in your alternative economy theory until they see it in practice. So the, 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 the difficult thing about partaking 
in taking things down is that you're going to have to do it at your cost. And that's terrible because, you know, how do you raise money for people to, to throw down a regime? Like no one's, no one's paying for regime throwing, you know, I wish someone had a fund for like regime throwing. Um, so I think the way that I go about it is every time I'm, I'm doing a work or an action, I ask myself, am I building or am I taking down? And I know if I'm taking down that I shouldn't expect to be paid for that work. But if I'm building, it is possible to be paid for that work because then you're, you're building the dignity of people, you're giving people a voice, you're teaching people how to express themselves, all these beautiful things. And in many ways, that work pays itself in just the, the joy of allowing people to become stronger and more dignified and, and more human. I think that there's enough payment in there. But yeah, choose and balance how much you want to be complicit in dystopia of the world or in the creation of a new one yeah maybe just to add on to that i think it's important also for photographers again learning doesn't stop um it, it continues uh, when you understand that this image is going to be difficult you still have the authority and in, in, in that moment to make an, a different image of that particular um, uh, uh, site that you're witnessing you know it's 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 a you don't have to photograph in that way in that particular problematic way because you're aware of it but you can put photograph in a different exciting way so photographers need to understand that they need to grow they need to grow their technique they need to really push their bound their boundaries to really get the best photograph without being unethical and and there's this opportunity for that i think we're starting to see some of those images beginning to come out quite strongly and uh, and and it's, it's a new new era of the, of the practice you know we are no longer in in 1922 when you photograph uh, uh people in a very particular way it shifts so photographs have to understand that they have to also shift you know it's, it's a practice of a profession and they have to be professional and understand that you know they need to grow the industry not to not to compromise it yes um unless anybody wants to add to the conversation i just want to give my thanks um, and um, invite the continuation uh, of the conversation and in fact action rather than um, just the conversation because again we can get mired in conversation and practical practical solutions the practical solutions that you've all been doing in fact and, and uh, often un, unnoticed um, but I think people are taking notice obviously when you get the New York Times to write that rubbish apology letter rubbish as it was, <laughs> you know people are taking notice, um, I know, um, you know, like a, I'm, a, I'm an English professor, I, I, I study language and how people avoid, avoid stuff when I read that letter, I was like classic, it's so useless, um, they, and you know some, they paid somebody to do that so well too, um, somebody was paid well to write that kind of rhetoric, so I think avoiding responsibility in itself is a job and it's a very um, kind of concentrated effort, as somebody was saying at this point, you know, we, we, we read that comment at this point to, to ignore kind of the racism in, inherent in our image world is, uh, it takes a concentrated effort. It takes a concentrated effort to keep pushing back with like language as, as those kinds of so-called apology letters or that sure. recognition letters do. Um, there's the labor that we do and there's that labor that they do with far more resources. That's the difference, you know. Um, but I think moving forward, we have projects coming and um, right now we don't have really um, structures to keep us going, but a collective is very much a welcome possibility to continue our education. If you know people who will fund us so that we don't just labor for free, please let them know. <laughs> We're happy to, I know how to write proposals and I know Legeto knows how to write proposals and I know everybody else here knows how to write proposals because we've done it. Um, we can write proposals and um, we are not going to steal anybody's money. We're going to actually do work that is um, useful <laughs> and will build um, rather than um, continue kind of destructive practices. And thank you so much all for coming and um, uh, I hope you will join us and I've given you um, the web page on which um, this video will be available in the future within a week or so. Thank you so much Nalika for this amazing hard work bringing this all together.
<laughs> was a pleasure. It was such a pleasure. Yes, community gives you strength to go on. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Bye, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.